Welcome to our monthly IHE Lunch and Learn. I'm glad that you could be here. Uh, this month, we are happy to have uh, Mario Haynes, Alexandra Gellner, and Samantha, and I will mispronounce your name, so I'll let you pronounce your name correctly when we get to you. Uh, we are, uh, they are representing the Anne Frank Center at the University of South Carolina, where we have a wonderful, wonderful relationship, and we're very proud of the work that we're doing together. We just finished in the West Side School District with the Exhibit and Education Program, and over 3,000 people, a part of the West Side community, were able to experience the exhibit. Mario is responsible as the on-site programmer and liaison for the theatrical education and artistic events that take place at the Anne Frank Center. He also serves as an educator in uh, pedagogy to get young people thinking about anti-racism, anti-Semitism, and anti-prejudice today. And while taking the Anne Frank exhibit across the country and training students to be docents of the Anne Frank and the World War II exhibits, Mario will be speaking along with his colleagues about the role of theater and how it relates to Anne Frank and the Holocaust. I'm gonna ask him to introduce his colleagues. I just wanna say that we are absolutely thrilled with, again, our relationship with the Anne Frank Center. Mario's had the chance to visit us twice. He told us that uh, he loves the students in Nebraska and we're honored to have uh, him and his colleagues with us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and put myself on mute. Well, thank you so much, Scott, and um, for all that invited the Anne Frank Center and our, our colleagues here today. So um, thank you that you've heard my introduction. I'm the artist director and director at the Anne Frank Center, um, not executive director. That's Dr. Doyle Stevick, but I direct many of the theatrical performances. And so I'm going to introduce you to, to you, um, Alexandra Gilner and Dr. Sam Mitchke. Um, Alexandra Gilner and I work very closely. She oversees all of our performances, especially out of New York City and very much for the whole country. She is a powerhouse and an artist and playwright in her own right. And um, she also received her MFA in acting from the New School for Drama. Um, Alex, do you wanna say hi? <laughs> Thank you, Mario. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, as Mario uh, mentioned, I am overseer or a uh, performance programming for Anne Frank Center USA. Um, here in, um, I'm, I'm chatting to you live from uh, New York. <laughs> Only time I'll ever say live from New York. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, I've been I've been with the uh, center since uh, 2016. First starting as an actor, portraying Anne. And um, since then, just been um, coordinating our performances uh, across the country to uh, really activate and um, and story for uh, for students and um, help them um, see uh, parallels in the relevance of her story today. And um, with that, I'd love to uh, pass it on to uh, Dr. Sam Mitchke, who is. Uh, Coming from uh, London and uh, is a professional um, of, with of Holocaust theater. Yes, yeah, Sam, feel free to say more about yourself, but uh, Dr. Sam Mischke is our good friend and a Holocaust theater historian specializing in plays and performances that depict the Nazi persecution of Jews and other groups from 1933 onwards. Um, she's written and edited collections that are world-renowned and I, I she is definitely one of the top um, theater Holocaust scholars in the UK and we're very fortunate to have her with us today. So Sam, feel free to say hi also. Thanks, Mario. Hi, everybody. Um, you, you folks are so close with the pronunciation of my surname. It is Mitch Kerr, not Mitch Key. So it's... But, no one died. It's fine. Um, so yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I am Sam. Um, you can tell from the accent that I am uh, British. Uh, my paternal family are German, non-Jewish. Um, I came into uh, Holocaust theatre completely by accident, but that's another story for another time. Um, I am a Holocaust theatre historian. I also work as a dramaturge, as a consultant. Um, I also work for the Holocaust Educational Trust here in the UK as an outreach educator. So I do go into schools, uh, colleges, universities, community groups, uh, sports clubs, wherever the trust send me, 
um, and I teach uh, about different aspects uh, of the Holocaust. My own personal interest is in representing the Holocaust through human stories and exploring the Holocaust through human stories. Um, because as we all know, it wasn't six million statistics that were murdered, it was six million stories. Um, I met uh, Alex uh, and then uh, Mario through giving an online lecture, an online workshop through Kane University back towards the beginning of the pandemic um, entitled So You Think You Know Anne Frank. Um, and Alex was there, one thing led to another, uh, and now here we are. So Mario, I will hand back over to you. Great. So I, I, you've already, what a great um, uh, wonder with words you are, Dr. Sam Michka. I, I've got you now. <laughs> I've got you. I'm going to make sure that I do well. So um, I was just going to talk a little bit about my intro to theater and how I began this work. And then Alex and Sam, if you'd like to do the same, and then we can talk a little bit about, um, for sure, um, Letters from Anne and Martin, which is a theater piece that Alex and I are heavily involved in. And then um, we can talk about some current um, theater pieces and stories that we are hearing about and being told. Um, so first, my first acting class that I ever took when I was at the University of Georgia, that's my undergrad, um, my, my acting teacher asked us, what is, what is theater? And we all went around and I had my answer ready. I said, theater is living under imaginary circumstances truthfully. And then another one of my colleagues, she said, my classmate, she said, well, theater is entertainment. And there was a, a slow cold wind that went through the air. And we were thinking, what, theater is entertainment? Maybe. And so um, Merla, our, my acting teacher said, theater is a lot of things, but it's not just entertainment. Theater can be entertaining, but theater is examining the human condition, what it is to be human, who we are, how we got here, what we are doing here. And I'm very interested in this work because I'm very drawn to narrative, the stories that we tell as a society and then the stories that we don't tell. And Anne Frank's story is a story that is very important to marginalized people, to Jewish people, to young women, and very much as a luminary for hope throughout the world in the, in the face of what it feels like impossible circumstances. Um, we all give tours, uh, particularly, I, I suppose me, because I'm in-house on staff here at the Anne Frank Center. So, you know, also with uh, directing theater, programming it, um, and doing other educational programs, uh, we give tours. And one thing I say in my tours is that some say that you can only judge a society on how they treat their most vulnerable, um, which is often the children. And we know that there were 1.5 million Jewish people that, uh, Jewish children that were murdered during the Holocaust. And Anne Frank may be one of the most famous of them, but as Sam said earlier, there, that also means that there are 1.5 million stories also. And one thing that I'm doing tonight, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, um, I never saw another butterfly. Um, it's a collection of drawings and poems from um, Terrazin concentration camp between 1942 and 1944. And, um, Sam, if I said the name of the camp wrong, feel free to jump in and, and correct me. Um, now I feel like I'm saying all the names wrong for everything. But um, here's, I have a collection here. And so there's a song cycle that I'm going to be uh, programming tonight. One of the seniors from the School of Music is going to be singing um, Lori Lightman's, um, the composer's uh, collection of songs from I Never Saw Another Butterfly. So, that's part of my my reasoning for being here that like I'm looking for different ways to engage our community and maybe our country on um, how art can be used to increase empathy and um, talk about things that we just sometimes don't know how to talk about. Um, so that's a little about me. That's a little about how I got into this work. 
And I was actually perhaps discovered by Alexandra Gellner because I was doing a production of Midsummer Night's Dream in upstate New York. And I told Alex that I really wanted to get back into being a teaching artist because the the grind of auditioning, you know, like I, I've always found that being of service just helped me as an artist and as a person. And so I'm very happy to be of service in this role as the artistic director here at the Anne Frank Center. And so I began teaching a couple of workshops, first art and propaganda, and then bystander to ally. So in art and propaganda, this is a workshop that we offer uh, from the Anne Frank Center. And um, it encourages young people to see, think, and wonder about the art that they're consuming. Um, if it's true, um, looking at um, how color may be used to, um, how to say, um, um, seduce them to think a certain way, but you know, critically thinking in the midst of this art. And theater very much increases critical thinking and empathy. And I'm also very drawn to protest theater. So that's a little about myself. And um, Alex, would you like to go next and say a little about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I really, as you know, as it's been mentioned, I, I am a, I'm a, I mean, I'm a theater artist. I um, have a, a master's in acting. I think what like really drew me to, um, it, just to to theater and to theater making was I was just curious to find if there's some way that we can can you teach empathy and so that's what I that's why I set off to 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 be an actor to be a theater ma maker is try to find some way like how do we how do we how do we teach that how do we and also um you know I wanted I was just just fascinated with stories and for a long time I didn't know I didn't know why but it became clear to me um as I continued my studies like well the more stories you're exposed to, the more empathy that builds in everyone. So if I can, if I can at least do that, you know, I will would have contributed something. And, you know, if what what better way to do it than to just like dive have you know bring people on the journey with you to dive straight into the darkest period of our one of the darkest periods of our world's history. Um, so when I got, when I, when they noticed that um, the Anne Frank Center was holding auditions for actors to play Anne Frank, um, I, it, I jumped at the opportunity just thinking, you know, it would be a steady occasional job playing Anne Frank. Um, but uh, I learned that there was, um, and at the time there was, that was just to audition for a solo show um, that activates a, a few of Anne's diary entries during her um, time in hiding. But then there was another show um that the center was doing called letters from Anne and Martin it was dual monologue side by side and Frank from her diary Dr. King from his letter from Birmingham jail two people seemingly very different lifetimes both in places of confinement speaking of the um oppression that they are experiencing from the world outside um but they're both born in the same year 1929 so the uh script had the the concept of the show had been come from um an Anne Frank Center staff member who um was was just leaving when I came on Hannah Vaughn and so she had the excerpts chosen and then um when I was hired to play Anne leadership at the time was like well you have a master's in theater why don't you why don't you go in and you know edit as you see fit um, and there wasn't really a lot to do. I mean, like the, you know, it's, it's Anne Frank's words and Dr. King's words. Um, you know, they're already like such prolific like, writers. Um, so of course the content was there. I just went in and just finagled a little bit to make those parallels between their two schools of thought, like really, really sing and bring that home to, to students. So they're really starting to think, draw connections, um, which I feel like is another important, you know, aspect to building empathy is drawing connections between yourself, other people, and the world around you. Um, so I'm happy to show a little clip of um, our show, Letters from Man and Martin, uh, the virtual, um, it's some clips from a virtual presentation that we did. One moment, it's been a while since I've shared my screen. Da, da, da. Gotta make sure that I am also sharing the sound, one moment. Uh, 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 uh,
De nazi's nemen er geen genoegen mee. Humiliated day in and day out. If it's that bad in Holland, what must it be like in those far away and uncivilized places the Germans are sending them? We assume that most of them are being murdered. Vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim. Freedom is never voluntarily given up by the oppressor, but it must be demanded by the oppressed. Be brave. Let's remember our duty and perform it without complaint. There will be a way out. Yours. Yours. Anna M. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank you. So that just gives you a little taste of um, what, what the performance is. And, um, and after the performance, uh, the actors um, go off stage, get out of costume, come back on as themselves and engage in conversation with the students about, um, you know, what, what they noticed, what they learned. Um, very often, I mean, students are first off surprised to learn that they were both born in 1929 in the same year, um, but also just they're, they're very surprised by the uh, parallels of their experiences. And um, yeah, so that that's one of the main things we do. And um, yeah, and we just we've been traveling the the nation with it. Excuse me for next stop is Baton Rouge for me. That'll be next week. And just to let you know, excuse me for interrupting, but just I think it's appropriate here. Uh, Dr. Mark Gudgel at the College of St. Mary here in Omaha. Uh, we're working with him right now and with Doyle to bring the play here uh, April of next year. Wonderful. We look forward to it then. And um, just to give credit what credit to you, the actors that you saw in that clip uh, was Parrish Bradley as Dr. King, and it was Rachel Griesinger playing Anne Frank. Um, but I don't, I'm sick of hearing my own voice, and I want to um, hear more from um, Dr. Michka about um, all the amazing um, work she does, because it's really, I've, I've learned um, a lot, a lot from her. Thank you very much. I love how I'm suddenly Dr. Mitchka and Sam, and not Sam anymore. It's, it's quite, quite Um, so yeah. So hi, everybody. Um, one of the the key things that I I want to draw out from what Mario and Alex have already said is this notion of empathy, um, because I think that ties us all quite nicely together. Because my PhD thesis was uh, British and American Holocaust theatre with a focus on empathy theory. Um, so looking at how Holocaust plays are created, what's the motivation behind them? Why do writers and practitioners create Holocaust plays? What is the impact or the potential impact on spectators? How does that function in terms of developing empathy? Um, I think there's a, there's a good old discussion to be had around whether you can teach empathy or is empathy a muscle in the same way that everybody has different athletic abilities everybody has an empathy muscle that is either better developed or with work can be developed and so on and so forth um in terms of of my work as well more broadly um i did train as an actor i also i did my masters uh, in playwriting uh, and then came in uh, to academia so I kind of I'm quite lucky I feel because I I get to straddle two worlds between the creative the artistic the theatre but then also the educational side um and also coming back to something that Mario said as well about you know um 
theatre as, as being seen as entertainment. And I think folks tell me if I'm speaking out of turn, but I feel like I'm speaking for all of us when I say that one of the biggest prejudices uh, and one of the biggest barriers that we encounter as artists, as theatre practitioners, as a theatre academic is people's preconceived notions of what theatre is. And people hear Holocaust, they hear theatre, um, and th th a lot of cognitive dissonance goes on. You see it in people's faces. One of the things that I um, have tried to do, um, especially in relation to adaptations of, of Anne Frank's diary, is to get people to either, if they ha don't already know about the Holocaust, is to start learning about the Holocaust. If they do know about the Holocaust, it's to get them thinking about it in a different way. So, for example, one of the things that I say about using, not using, working with uh, the diary and an adaptation of it is how does it change when we get it from page to stage? What happens when we get it from this book? If we mark out the measurements of the secret annex on the floor in masking tape and get students moving around within that space, within those limitations, that's a new way into the text for them. Um, and one of the things that I uh, talked about in the workshop where I first met Alex was the way that theatre enables students to learn, especially those who struggle with learning or can't learn in traditional ways. So, for example, if you have a dyslexic student who really struggles with the written word and reading off the page, that's theatre helps to open up that world for them and helps them to move. You can get them thinking about different aspects. What are the props that need to be involved? Costumes. What would the costumes look like from that time? How would we show them getting older or smaller or um, set, lighting, sound? Um, the, the background research, all of these different things, it's a new way in and it gets students' minds opening. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about the theatre is, as Mario said, it takes us back to the human condition. How did we get here? And especially in the current moment as well, um, you know, the rise of fascism, the rise of neo-Nazism. Theatre is, I'm not a fan of the term, but it opens up a safe space for spectators to start those uncomfortable conversations, for us to introduce those uncomfortable conversations, um, to get them thinking about the past and hopefully unconsciously making the connections with the present. One of the things that I always say through my work and my teaching is that through theatre looking at the Holocaust and through the teaching that we do, we can essentially hold a Medusa's mirror up to the present. If you try and confront people with what is happening now and in the moment, people don't want to listen for myriad reasons. It could be media oversaturation. It could be, you know, really contentious issues, things that, you know, can divide families and, and friendships. Even everybody has their own views. But if you're teaching about, as Alex said, one of the darkest periods in human history and you're holding up that mirror so people don't have to look at it directly, but they can still see today's issues reflected into it. Then good work is being done. And I think that ties in with what Mario and Alex are doing and essentially what we're all trying to do which is to get people thinking in new ways, having those difficult conversations and exploring them and looking at the world around them, all while potentially sitting in a room and watching one piece of theatre. And Mary, I'll hand back over to you. Yeah, so maybe we can just kind of chat about what we spoke about, us three. You, I mean, for one thing, the passage of time is always really, um, I don't know, it needs to be done with care um, in any story that you're telling. And for example, you were just talking about costuming a, a little bit, Sam. And I was thinking about like for productions of the Diary of Anne Frank that we sometimes advise, I'm always curious about like how, you know, they've, they've been in hiding for a little over two years, like how that can be, um, you know, showcased, um, you know, how can we, we tell the story without 
being so directly on the nose, like just really world building, building the world of some of these plays. Um, um, yeah, Sam, Alex, have you seen any pieces recently as you thought about like time passing on stage or anything like that? Yes, there is a um, new Tom Stopper play on um, Broadway um, where uh, called Leopoldstadt. That is um, him uh, just diving. It's it's semi um, autobiographical. I mean, it's 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 essentially about his, about his family and their persecution uh, from the Holocaust. And what's very um, telling of a top and Tom Stopper play it's a lot of people like you know it was big families talking in um in big rooms um often over each other several conversations going on but then you see them over the course of several generations so the play starts in 1899 and then moves to 1900 and then 1920s um just before the rise of um Nazi party and then you see them in 1942 like 1930s, 1942, and then 1955. Um, so just seeing that whole passage of time and just the way that the, just the, the, the worldview, you, know, you see the um, optimism of, of the families, like, you know, right before the turn of the century and, um, and, you know, their whole idea of like, what is, what is it to be Jewish? Um, and, uh, and then seeing how that just evolves over the course of, of, these generations because of everything that's happening in the world around them um is, is just is really fascinating and i'm i'm now reminded of um a talk from um michael barnbaum who is uh, probably a familiar um name in this circle um and a, a leading leading scholar in um in holocaust education talking about how you know how we talk about the holocaust the further away um we we um are from it um and you know how right on the heels of the holocaust and remember there was you know especially in america there was just a little bit of distance because also there was um you know we had we had our own political you know reckoning and um with with mccarthyism and blacklisting it was just like oh but we're not going to talk about the war anymore we're, we're not gonna no there's no anti-semitism in america but then slowly as as we've gotten further away from it honestly there seems to be a way that we're, we're remembering more or there's it feels more of an urgency to remember more, which has been really fascinating. Um, but yeah, that's just that those are just thoughts that have like come up when talking about, you know, just the passage of time and what that the role that plays in um with our examination of this time. Um Sam, do you have any other thoughts? I mean, I, I have a few, but I would love to hear from you also. Um, I yeah, I would Leopoldstadt was amazing. Um, I saw it when it was here in, in London. Um, and it, in the end, as Alex said, you know, there's a lot of conversations, a lot of things that are going on. So I just treated it like Game of Thrones and did not try and understand who each individual character was and just sat well, back. I, and I was getting so story. I was just like <laughs> I'm not going to try to remember everybody's name and face. I was like, it's just it so you just kind of have a little then, wash over you when you watch a Tom Stoppard. Exactly. Play. But then as you get, as the action continues and then you you feel like you start to know the family unit. Um, and it's a brilliant play. And the, the other one that immediately sprang to mind when you said about Passage of Time as recent production here of Good by C.P. Taylor. And it had um, David Tennant doctor who um in the leading role um and essentially what it does is it follows his story he he plays a, a doctor who is essentially a good person and is not sure if he's a i know i'm a good person i'm a good person and you know you see him with you know his his best friend and his wife and and sort of moving through when he has a mother who has dementia so dealing with that and then he's in a clinic and he's working with with patients who have uh, dementia and then throughout the course of the play it's a, essentially about the stories that good people tell themselves to justify the decisions that they make as they descend further and further into essentially fascism 
Nazism, oppression. Um, spoiler alert, if you don't want to hear the ending, plug your ears. Um, but the end of the play ended with David Tennant, and we were told we weren't allowed to take any photos, and this is why, uh, in the full regalia of an SS man at Auschwitz um, and realising where he is. Um, and then he goes off. So he has this moment where the the action is underscored with music that he says he can hear you know in like this kind of movie underscore that he says he can hear in his head and he talks about a different music that he hears playing at times and it ends at Auschwitz with him in front of an actual prisoner orchestra on stage and saying this time the music was real and then you know curtain so watching that yeah there you go so watching that um really you know the passage of him having these relationships with different people him wanting you know ultimately release for his mother and then the notion of euthanasia he's involved in the nazi t4 program and you know so then sort of all of these bigger questions but the the question being well what are the questions that we ask ourselves as human beings on a daily basis and how do those change and how do we adapt over time to either fight against or justify what's happening around us and what we're doing ourselves so those those were my immediate thoughts so i don't know if i answered your question at all there mario but that was no, it, it, you know it was kind of more of a um i don't know a provocative thought that i would just like for us to think on truly and i think the first well i know the first piece of holocaust theater that i saw was um, Sam Mendes production of um, Cabaret, which is the musical version of I Am A Camera. And that, for some reason, like I had seen the film before when I was in my film studies class in college, but the, the theater piece just really showcased to me that we were talking about the Holocaust in the midst of all of that. I don't think that when I saw the movie when I was in college that that came across for me. And I think that, you know, there's a phrase that is said sometimes that television is furniture, film is art, but theater is life. Like you're breathing the same air as the individuals on stage. And, you know, whether we're talking about the passage of time or just the fact that like there's a muscularity uh, th that is called upon to do eight shows a week. Um, it's kind of a feat of nature, really. And seeing that production of Cabaret, it just, um, it, it was all done with, it was done with a lot of nudity, actually. And nudity that the lighting, it wasn't about anything lustful or lascivious. It was about like, the beauty of bodies and the beauty of bodies that were lost um, also. So there are just many images that will forever be with me from seeing that production. And, you know, I think it's really fortunate, you know, I love being an educator and I love being a theater maker because, you know, who's to say there's, there are images that Alex and I have done on stage that may be with the young people the rest of our lives or, you know, something that you've dramaturged or directed yourself, Sam, like, these are storytellings as we think of our current climate that will be with individuals forever. And, you know, whenever I'm directing a piece, I say to myself, well, why this piece now? And I think that if anyone were to ask a, a question of, well, why Holocaust theater? I would say, well, well, why not? Because, I mean, if there's anti Semitism or hate that is still happening, then then there's a need for stories about it to educate and to um i mean i'm going to use the word protest like to help us like conjure the strength to attack it because yes the educators need to be doing what the educators need to do but the art makers they need to do what the art makers need to do i would say um so i've talked a lot now um it's 105 we could open it up to well actually we're in a different time zone i'm on eastern standard time i know that you're all in central time um are there any questions for us that anyone would like to ask us just a little bit about 
whether it's um, the Anne Frank Center's theatrical works. Um, and there's also a show called Conversations with Anne, which is a one woman show, um, typically for younger audience, where um, the actress playing Anne answers uh, questions to young audiences in character as Anne Frank. But um, are there any questions that anyone has for us currently? Uh, or... I have a question. Sure. I'll start it off. Uh, in the play with uh, dealing with, with Anne Frank and with Martin Luther King Jr., what's been the most, uh, the, the reaction that you had that you didn't expect? Is it, has there been something in particular? Um, well, we often, we often get very emotional responses, but I, I sometimes like when someone throws us a question back. I remember an audience member asked us, well, what are some other writers or, or things that were written in confinement that you, you would love to see in conversation with Anne Frank's diary? And, um, I believe someone said something about um, Harriet Jacobs. Harriet Jacobs was an enslaved woman who um, uh, wrote her narratives um, also. Um, that was one thing that I had not thought about, but um, I'm just interested sometimes when individuals give us, you know, thoughts about the show or feedback or how it touches them in a sense. And um, many times individuals speak about how um, they have lived through um, moments of segregation in the United States and how the play um, makes them, you know, just show, showcase the fact that Martin and Anne were very much contemporaries being born in the same year. And so like just the things from the audience members that get me um, my imagination percolating, because I think that the role of theater many times is to spark the imaginations of the doctors and scientists and lawyers, because, you know, it is often that um, the anti-Jewish decrees were legal and the segregation laws were legal. So um, these things that get us speaking about are always just really exciting to me. Anything else my colleagues want to say before we um, answer Stephen Jay's question? I know he's raising his hand. Yeah, I think I, I don't know if it was a presentation I did, but I understand that there were um, there's one presentation that happened of um, letters from Ann and Martin where um, there were some students of color that had spoken up and um, saying that like, uh, they had not considered before like, oh, that this sort of violent um, oppression could happen um, to white bodies. Um, so I think that was something that uh, I guess I hadn't considered that there's just, you know, I'm just like constantly reminding me like, okay, wait, this is, you know, we live with the, with the, with the, the history of the information so much. We're not sure like, you know, like how, how well it's, how well it's known, like, you know, are we repeating ourselves? Does everybody know this? But um, it's always just, you know, at, at least a, a little bit of a, a jolt to me being remembering like, oh, well, you know, it's not, we're, I mean, we're teachers, we're, <laughs> we're teaching, we're sharing. Uh, um, so just to, to consider, to consider that it was, um, it was a good, good reminder for me. Steve? Um, the speakers give us some reading uh, references in regards to these theater issues that they're uh, talking about. Oh, would you like for us to have some follow up things in the chat or some um, a, a website or some sort? Is that what you're requesting, sir? Uh, websites, uh, writings. Could send it to Scott so he could forward to the listeners. Sure, uh, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah, thank you. And, and you, you can go to to London and go through uh, Sam's library. There, she's pointing to. We have a question from uh, Dana Knox. Uh, do you perform primarily in schools? Do you present plays written by unknown playwrights? Uh, 
Um, so yeah, we present mostly um, in schools and we are invited to um, educator conferences just to spread the word about the work that we're doing um, with um, teachers and educators so we can hopefully um, come visit them in their school. Um, currently, the it's just these two performances that, um, that, that we bring um, um, to schools. Uh, the, the hope is that we would um, develop uh, other um, pieces of theater that would uh, teach parallel stories um, to Anne Frank's um, diary because she was not the only diarist or writer during the Holocaust. There were many, many others, some that even kept, um, were able to keep diaries within the concentration camps. Um, in terms of uh, unknown playwrights, I, I wish we had the capacity for it, but uh, it's a, it's an unusual, we're kind of like a, we're a tiny theater company inside a, um, Holocaust education organization. Um, and even, even that family is very, you know, they're, they're a few of us, but we're also a mighty, mighty few. Um, so there's always the, you know, the hope and wish to do more, but um, we, but I'm, I'm grateful for all, all the AHO conferences that we have that we, that um, connect us with other um, theater artists so that we um, learn more about the work that they're doing and the stories that they're bringing um, to the world. Just so you know, uh, to the group, uh, in May, our Lunch and Learn is going to be on other diaries, other found manuscripts uh, based on the work uh, Salvage Pages, which is a fabulous educational resource. If, if you don't know about it. We have some copies in our office if anybody would like uh, to see it. But yeah, often we find in schools, um, not for any, well, just that often people, because just in the education that the kids don't realize, sometimes even the teachers, that there was more than one, there are hundreds, if not thousands of manuscripts in some form or another of uh, recording of experiences. Other questions? Lynn, please take your off, yourself off mute. You're on mute. Sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. And I also, it's not a question, it's a comment. I just wanted to say that I never realized that Martin Luther King and Anne Frank were born on the same, in the same year. So I think that's fascinating. And I also think that it's wonderful that you could do something that connects them. Because I didn't even realize that there was, I mean, I knew that about the, um, I lived through the 60s, so I'm just saying, I just think it's very interesting that a connection was made there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's always it's always um, good to hear from students when, you know, they, they have an aha moment like that. We found that, I mean, it seems, you know, in, in history or in classes now, there, there seems to be some knowledge of Anne Frank and based upon that it's it's read so almost universally in seventh or eighth grade in, in American public schools. Have you found that uh, there's an ignorance of understanding of knowing about Martin Luther King Jr. since um, in, in some way, I mean, he's been deceased for over 50 years. Have you found that people don't know necessarily who he is, but know, but know Anne Frank? No, um, I haven't found that. Have you, Alex? Honestly, I mean, like I, when, you know, when I'm playing, when I'm the, when I'm the educator introducing the performance and I'm not playing Anne, you know, I always start with like, okay, how many people are familiar with Anne Frank in her diary? And I see a raise of hands. Um, it's about half the amount of students that are aware of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, often because, you know, we, and uh, that being said, you know, a lot of our performances, you know, do, um, happen around January and February when students are learning about Dr. King because he just had his birthday and then it's Black History Month. Um, <clears throat> so they're more, I think they're more aware of, of Dr. King um, just because a lot of schools like, you know, teach um, about Dr. King um, about for, for his birthday and then Black History Month. Um, but I don't know, you know, but oftentimes, you know, it's uh, the, the, the whole just all we all we really know about Dr. King is I have a dream is, you know, really the the hopeful um, you know, message that he had and 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 not the um, you know, kind of tough love critiquing that he was he was doing of of the world around him, which letters does do 
a little bit and he talks about the complacency of the white man um and uh and yeah so it's um i i i often find that like you know kids know less about anne frank than dr king yeah well and not that we're 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 just taking the quote out of context but it was the complacency of um yeah sorry liberals i believe is that what it mm -hmm. is the, the yeah. white moderate. the white moderate yeah yeah, yeah. Other questions? Uh, Sherry, you had a question you posted in the chat. If you could come up uh, and ask it, because I don't quite understand the question. Give you a second there. Other questions? Uh, her mic isn't working. She posted in chat. If you would, if you can see it there. Mm, I'm not seeing anything in the meeting chat. Okay. Um, my cousin is, I'm going to pronounce this word wrong, a liberatist of yours. Anne has ever, has, has, I don't understand this, but has that ever been performed here? My, I, I guess the name of the play is my cousin is a, uh, the play, the name of the play is yours. So I'm sorry, yours, Anne. Do you know of that play? Oh, um, I'm, I have, I have heard of it. It is not one of our, we, um, We've only in in house have developed these these scripts, um, conversation and then and letters from Ann and Martin. So um, if it's another um, another play, um, we that's we we don't usually do other other people's works, but we're we're always there to support. And and when we were at the AHO conference in Miami in January of this year. And just um, to, so people know, the Association of Holocaust Organizations, of which IHE is a, is a member. Right. So when we went to this conference earlier this year, there was a lot of focus on theater education, Holocaust theater education. And um, there's an initiative by Arnold Mil Middleman to have readings regularly. So I would love to do readings more regularly of some of these works to share with communities, especially around Holocaust remembrance events. But um, as Alex said, our capacity doesn't, we're often doing letters or conversations with Anne or exhibit programs that we <clears throat> do it as often as we would like to. But yours, yeah. Anne? These performances are just, just a, a small segment of the programs that we do that are those meant to teach towards Anne's story and uphold her legacy here in, in the States. Um, so, I mean, we're not a, a theater organization. It's just a small part of what we do. But um, Mario did mention um, Arnold Miniman, who is a president of the National Jewish Theater Foundation and founding director of the um, National Jewish Theater Foundation Holocaust Theater International Initiative at the University of Miami Miller Center of Contemporary Pu Public Contemporary Judaic Studies, which is a mouthful. But this is his book. Sam has worked very closely with him, so I'd love to um, hand it over to her to talk more about um, if you want to. That is, is your name is on the book. Is it your name on the book, Sam? Also, um, I no, I didn't. I I'm not a co-author. No, sad, sad panda. Um, but no, yes. So, um, the 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 work that Arnold does and how I uh, came to work with Arnold, um, is through a project called What I've Seen, uh, spelled S C E N E, uh, and what that essentially does is uh goes into schools and uh, we've run two pilot projects. We did the pilot project in Miami in November 2018, uh, and then we did the British pilot in November 2021. Um, and essentially what we did was went into schools. Um, and used theatre techniques, uh, primarily frozen images, tableaus, uh, in conjunction with survivor testimony to uh, teach students about the Holocaust and to help um, strengthen their knowledge of the Holocaust. Um, and as part of that, I ran um, evaluations. There were surveys, there were questionnaires. Uh, I think the final report that I wrote was about 60,000 words. So if you'd like a copy, let me know, print off two, one for each side of the bed. Um, and what we found it was really helpful to do as well was not only to engage students with the Holocaust, but also to help schools to identify um, areas of weakness in student knowledge. So for example, um, we had a surprising number of students who 
uh, hadn't heard of Auschwitz. Uh, we had a large number of students who self-identified anti-Semitism as one of the aspects about the Holocaust in general that they knew the least about. So we were actually able to take that back to the schools and say, you're doing great work. The, you know, the caveat, the students have only just started learning about the Holocaust. However, in terms of the intersection between anti-Semitism, anti-discrimination, anti-racism work, there are some terms that the students uh, are unfamiliar with you might want to address this um so um also on the subject another uh, initiative that um arnold is involved with it's a resource that stephen might be interested in as well it's something i use a lot in my research um and it is the holocaust theater catalog um i believe the address the, the web address is htc dot miami dot edu i could be wrong uh, but what that um does is and continues to do is tries to compile a bibliography of every holocaust uh, play performance piece on the planet the last time i checked there was something in the region of 900 um so if and you can search by subject so you might want perpetrator bystander zonder commando thank you mario he's just popped it into the chat um you can search by author you can search by year you can search by play title it's a really really great resource um so i thoroughly recommend it and again that's something else that arnold has spearheaded in conjunction with with other other practitioners and this is his book that um talks about his the, book. um there it is this the uh lessons and that um that he implements in schools of, and with the exercises that sam was mentioning there it is wonderful any other questions that we have well i want to thank you three this is enlightening and i look forward to uh, uh dr mark gudgel who is a colleague of ours here in omaha and uh, has been in touch with doyle and we are the th well that we're trying to work out we will work out to bring the play here uh next april and a whole bunch of programming around it another one of our new partners is the college of saint mary since uh since he's in, on his first year on staff there. He was a teacher in the Omaha Public Schools before that. So next month, our speaker will be one of our own. It's going to be Kelly Tishauer kirk and she has just finished her master's degree in Holocaust Studies through Gratz University, and also is a third-generation Holocaust survivor and is going to be sharing parts of her story and how it relates to her education and how she's moving forward now with her degree and as uh, hopefully the newest member of our Speakers Bureau. So again, thank you. And I look forward to seeing all of you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Mario, for arranging all this. Of course. Happy Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you.